So I apologize that you have to listen to me for a second time. I was hoping that at least one of my two collaborators would be able to come, but, but uh, neither could. So uh, it's me again. And uh, not only is it me again, but it's also that I'm really not qualified to talk about this <laughs> because um, life, um, so my background is in, in physics and astronomy. Uh, and you know, that was, that's also my natural connection to high altitude ballooning physics uh, experiments, astronomy experiments, cosmic rays and things like that. Um, and so, uh, you know, why am I talking about this? Uh, we're definitely not the only ballooning group that has thought about it. Yesterday, we, we heard a really good talk by um, uh, Tim Kroger and uh, Michelle Gibson uh, about uh, doing experiments with yeast. Uh, and so there's definitely also other groups doing this. And so the reason I, I thought it would be interesting for me to think about how to talk about it is because um, two reasons. One, uh, one of the most gratifying parts of getting into high altitude ballooning uh, is the interdisciplinary nature of it. So, you know, we have this platform and then, you know, uh, we don't have to decide what uh, discipline students do their experiments in, but we can leave that up, up to them. Uh, and that's been a very exciting aspect uh, of that. And, and it's also allowed me to uh, get in touch with colleagues in environmental science and biology and in chemistry and learn myself. It's definitely every time there's a new student experiment, I learn a lot uh, from doing that. And that's really something that I, I would highly recommend everybody try, try to do because, uh, you know, it's, there's nothing more fun than, than learning yourself. Teaching, of course, is also great. But, um, and just a, 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 brief, a brief overview over uh, the kinds of balloon flights that we're doing at DePaul. Uh, so we've done, we started in March uh, 2009 uh, and have done 46 flights uh, since then. And the majority of flights are for science majors. So it's four different areas. We've done uh, undergraduate research programs as part of the Sirius program and another program I was talking about yesterday. Um, we've done, uh, worked with uh, undergraduates in environmental science on senior thesis projects. And, um, we've uh, used it as part of an atmospheric chemistry course for, for, uh, science and chem for uh, environmental science and chemistry majors. And in fact, we got started with the Society of Physics Students. Um, then something that we just recently started is to work with community colleges. That's new. And of course, there, uh, I'm just helping them do flights. I don't really, the, the, the faculty from the community colleges decide what kind of projects they want to do. Uh, but then um, the, the two areas where, uh, you know, life science experiments really come in for me are uh, the, the flights we do as part of general education courses. So uh, we have two programs at DePaul uh, that uh, offer all the courses that are not in the major. One is the liberal studies program, one is the honors program. And so our students have a requirement of three science courses, including one lab science course. And so I offer ballooning as, uh, as one of those lab uh, science courses. And then we've also done outreach to both high school and middle school uh, schools. And uh, there's always, uh, in, in both of these uh, areas, there's always a lot of interest in, in uh, flying living organisms. Uh, and, you know, why is that? Definitely doesn't come from me, uh, you know, in, in, in fact, you know, initially after being really excited and, you know, uh, okay, let's fly some crickets and let's see if they survive and so on, I got pretty frustrated pretty quickly because the science wasn't really that meaningful, you know, I couldn't really help the students design uh, projects that are actually where they learn more than whether they were able to design a capsule that allows the crickets to survive. Um, and, uh, you know, and then I kind of started discouraging these kinds of projects, but I don't like to do that. You know, I like to have the students determine what, what they want to investigate. Uh, and so then finally I started talking to some colleagues in, in the life sciences. Um, and um, this we've seen yesterday. Uh, and, uh, you know, the question is why is there so much interest in, in life science experiments? And I think part of it is that the students really would like to know what it's like to be up there themselves. What is it like to be in space? You know, it's also why we have a, um, a manned space, part of the reason why we have a manned space flight program, even though robots in, in many ways are, are better, it's because there's nothing like seeing 
a human being or a living organism in space. So basically, I think for a lot of students, having something that's alive on a balloon flight is kind of a proxy for the experience they would have themselves. Not many people get the chance to do this. In fact, there's only two <laughs> or three. One person didn't survive who, who's, uh, who've done this. And so maybe the next best thing is to send a proxy, like a, you know, a, a cricket, uh, and to see what it's like. Um, and so, so what kind of science can you do? Well, one of the obvious choices is to look at what happens uh, with radiation. Uh, how, do, how are living organisms affected by, by radiation? We've all, maybe not all, but a lot of people have done these kinds of experiments where you, you've used a simple Geiger counter connected to a data logger. This is a veneer data logger. Um, and, uh, you know, when uh, Earth is constantly being bombarded by these particles that travel at nearly the speed of light, 90% of them are protons, and we don't really know where they come from because they're charged, so they get, their trajectories get bent by the galactic and the solar system and the, uh, the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, and we get bombarded from all directions, you know, it's completely isotropic. Uh, and when these <coughs> mostly protons uh, hit Earth's <coughs> atmosphere uh, at a certain altitude, uh, they're more likely to, than not to hit a, a nucleus of an oxygen or a nitrogen atom. Uh, and when that happens, they cause a small nucle nuclear reaction and cre create all these secondary particles and create this, this shower of particles that rains down. Now, most particles only live for nanoseconds. Uh, and don't make it to the ground, but there are some, especially muons, that make it all the way down to the ground. I'll talk about that in, in just a second. Uh, and so uh, the, uh, I think here's a graph that we recorded in October of last year, where you can kind of see that, uh, you know, after launch, there is an increase. It's about 10% uh, increase in, in uh, intensity per uh, 300 meters. Uh, and, of course, that's due to the fact that these particles coming down, muons, are charged. So as they uh, zoom by um, the atmospheric molecules, they interact with the electrons and lose energy and, and so eventually get absorbed. Uh, and so uh, on a balloon, you get higher and higher intensities the higher you go. And, but this doesn't, of course, continue forever, but, but gets to th this region here about 15 to 20 kilometers up where uh, secondary particle uh, production is at its maximum, uh, the Pazzo maximum. And then above that, uh, you get a larger and larger percentage of primary particles. Um, and uh, of course, you know, our living organisms are affected by this radiation in some way. Um, a very interesting application, and I think um, Gordon was talking about that on Wednesday. I wasn't here, but, but uh, we've also discovered that we can do a lot of really interesting experiments with muons on the ground. So um, here's a setup that we built where you can, you can uh, tilt the... So th these are, these are uh, Geiger counters that are aligned so that the Geiger-Muller tubes are in line. And so by, by tilting the, the setup, we can kind of look at different zenith angles. We can look at the cosmic ray intensity straight up or, or at different zenith angles. And there's really interesting dependence. That's well known. Uh, it's about uh, the intensity in the zenith times cosine squared, uh, at least for angles that are not too close to the horizon. Um, and so there's some in really interesting science you could do. Here's another interesting diagram. So this is, this is in the zenith, and it shows the dependence of cosmic rays on um, barometric pressure. So, uh, you know, because cosmic rays or muons get uh, uh, absorbed by the, the mass of the atmosphere they have to travel uh, through, the more mass there is above you, the more muons you're going to absorb. And of course, having a higher bar barometric pressure means that there's more atmosphere above you. And so you get a dependence. It's called the a barometric coefficient of about 0.1% um, per millibar of atmospheric pressure. <coughs> and it takes a long time with, with a setup like that to get this. So this is about um, uh, 39 days of data. Uh, and, uh, but, but, but nevertheless, you know, it's a great way to have students use uh, the kind of the same equipment they would fly in the balloon also on the ground. Um, 
Okay, so then of course there's also ultraviolet radiation. So uh, fortunately, there's uh, you, often we talk about three different bands of ultraviolet radiation: UVA with the longest wavelengths, lowest energies; UVB, a uh, little bit higher energies, and then UVC. And of course, UVC is by far the most dangerous uh, type of radiation for us. But fortunately, we're almost completely protected from that by the ozone layer, um, uh, while UVA makes it almost all the way to the ground. But but here you can see the um, a typical uh, burst altitude of a balloon, and we're definitely going uh, above uh, in, in regions where the uh, ultraviolet exposure uh, is much higher than it is on the ground. Um, another good reason to uh, think about life science experiments is that if you work with teachers, that's a very natural connection to make. All of these uh, effects of, of radiation on living organisms, mutations, and so on, are key concepts in the K-12 curriculum. So for example, um, in the next generation science standards, NGSS, um, there, are, there, are two, there are four life science standards, and two of them are directly related to um, like inheritance, variations of traits, evolution, uh, diversity. And uh, you know, students have to investigate things like the effects um, on uh, the effects of mutations on structure and function, uh, survival rates, reproduction rates, uh, heritable uh, mutations, um, natural selection. These are all concepts that you can that you can investigate uh, with by exposing living organisms to uh, ultraviolet and cosmic radiation. So, of course. Um, it's not just an interesting topic in K-12, but, but understanding how living organisms re react to space conditions is also an area of very active science research. Uh, there's a whole organization about that, the uh, ASGSR, I forget now what that stands for, American Society for Gravitational and Space Research, I think. Um, and uh, you know, there, there are lots of uh, professional scientists who uh, study uh, the exposure of, of uh, living organisms to space conditions. And here's some examples. So for example, microbe research is interesting because microbes can serve as a model organism for understanding how humans will be affected by space conditions. Um, it's important to understand microbes in space, also for understanding how you would go about detecting uh, microbes, say, on other planets. Um, it's important to understand them because you, don't, you want to avoid contaminating other planets when you send spacecraft. Um, and of course, they might also play a role in the origin of life on Earth and, and its spread through the solar system. So, so it's also uh, not just part of the curriculum, but there are also really nice and interesting connections you can make to things that you can read in the newspaper about, um, uh, about, about scientific research, which is always nice and enriching for the students to see that what they're studying is actu actually has relevance uh, in current scientific research as well. Uh, for for uh, plant seed research, um, uh, there are also a number of reasons why we want to understand how plant seeds are affected by uh, space conditions. One is that for long duration space flight, which is, I know, a big deal at, uh, uh, at this university, uh, almost certainly uh, we'll have to learn how to grow, grow food. Um, and uh, so here's a, uh, a picture from a, a, a growth chamber that's on the International Space Station at the moment. And you probably all read about, uh, in, yeah, two minutes, okay, great. Um, read about the, uh, them growing uh, lettuce and, and you know, uh, basically thinking about ways in which you can grow a significant portion of the food in space. Uh, some, especially in China, uh, exposure to cosmic rays is used for plant, plant breeding. Um, and then also plants are very resistant to uh, cosmic rays, so they might play an important role for the spread of life throughout the universe. Um, you don't have to start from scratch. So if you're interested in this, there are really good curricula, not related to ballooning, but for example related to exposing uh, microbes and exposing seeds to uh, germicidal light sources, for example, or to cobalt-60 uh, radioactive sources, which you, you can buy seeds that have been exposed to that uh, from bio uh, Carolina Biological and other, other uh, science supply companies. 
Uh, and then there are curricula, and oftentimes these work really well for ballooning as well. One of my favorite ones is the, um, this one here, uh, a classroom guide to yeast experiments, which is on the uh, uh, Kansas State Physics Department website. It's called uh, the Gene Project. Um, we, for our experiments, we used uh, a, a strain of yeast that was actually developed at Kansas State University, which has uh, a mutation that has the adenine biosynthesis um, disrupted, or disrupts the adenine biosynthesis, so that if you put uh, these yeast in a medium without adenine, without external adenine, they don't really grow well and they turn red whereas the ones that have mutated turn cream color and get, get much larger. So it's a really great way of doing a visual analysis, analysis of mutation rates as well as survival rates. Uh, and these are also available from Carolina Biological. And they're really easy to, to handle. So you know, it's as simple as taking a, a toothpick and putting some of the yeast in, in some water and then putting them in, in little plastic baggies, taping them to the inside and outside of the of the pod, so you can all do this, even if you have no background at all in biology. Um, post flight is equally simple. You just take that water and you spread it onto the media. You can either buy pre-poured plates or powdered uh, media. Uh, and you don't even need an incubator for yeast. It grows at room temperature. Um, and you can do a genetic analysis using uh, visual examination of the plates. So, so it's extremely low uh, tech, no, no special equipment required. Uh, here's a, a presentation that uh, last month my students gave. These were students, non-science majors, in an honors program class about this. Um, and you know, they, come, they get some really interesting results. For example, yeast does not survive if it fl flies on the outside. Uh, yeast on the inside of a, of a payload container has variable survival rates, and in fact, the higher the survival rate, the lower the mutation rate, and vice versa. So that seems to say it's not the temperature that kills the yeast, it's, it's indeed the cosmic rays. Uh, and there are many other interesting questions to investigate about DNA repair mechanisms and so on. You don't have to uh, understand all of this yourself because there's really excellent curriculum uh, that I've personally used that, that you can definitely work with very easily, even as a, as a physical scientist. Um, for seeds, we kind of focused on seeds that have a very short life cycle so that the students can complete a project within one course. So, so Wisconsin Fast Plants have a 40-day life cycle, so that's really great. You can do multi-generational studies even within one course. Um, and we also, also use garden radishes, which also have a short life cycle and very easy to handle, especially for middle school students. Um, and they, they're, they almost completely have 100% survival rate. So even on the outside, if you have a packet of uh, seeds on the outside of a pod, it usually survives. Um, but we, you do find, we, we measured a variability in terms of how many seed pods are there, how many flowers, how long are the seed pods, what's the weight of the plant. And you find a nice correlation between uh, whether the seeds were flown on the outside versus the inside and the variability of all of these traits. So there does seem to be uh, a, a, an effect on, um, on the variability of, at least, of, uh, of uh, the plants. And I think uh, here's some, some data that you, know, you can see. All I'm trying to show here is that it's really simple data collection, a number of flowers, number of seed pods, uh, length of the seed pods. We use some simple ANOVA statistics as well as uh, define a coefi coefficient of variation to do the statistical analysis, but there are many other uh, uh, possibilities, of course. Okay, so that's, that's uh, what I wanted to say. Yes, Ron. Okay, um, let's see, just a quick question. I, I've heard, and I don't doubt that this is true, that conditions at 100,000 feet are, are not unlike those at the surface of Mars, at least in terms of uh, pressure. pressure. Um, at the surface, uh, probably UV radiation. Um, even though Mars is a little more distant, maybe there's some absorption of uh, UV. So, so those might be similar. I actually haven't looked into the details, but I like that link for students, you know, uh, and provide that extra motivation to put together ex an experiment, yeah. pitching it as, hey, this is an analog environment to the surface of yeah. Mars. Have you tried that? 
Uh, no, I haven't, I haven't made the connection to Mars. Uh, you know, I was also familiar with uh, the, you know, you hear that a lot, that uh, yeah. pressure at 100,000 feet is about the same as on yeah. the surface of Mars. <coughs> but I, I agree that that's a nice, the students could even investigate, you know, in what ways are the conditions similar yeah. uh, to, to those on the surface of Mars, for sure. Yeah. I'll just mention that I guess the students are planning to launch, so I'm going to get down there and I'm going to check on that. <coughs> Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, um, I think this is really great because biological experiments has always been, when you do those, those are the ones that are less obvious, so this is really great. A um, couple, of, couple of things that we've experienced, one is um, I was trying to push, use the sensors, right, because then you can get data continuously up and down. One of the things we did for yeast that actually worked very well is use a CO2 sensor. And we actually saw that CO2 production cut off. But then when they came back down, it started up again, showing that, yes, yeast production or yeast activation or whatever activity stopped at the high elevation, yeah. and it came back at the lower elevations. Uh -huh. and the other thing is that we found <coughs> thinking through exposure. So for example, if you wanted to experiment with UV exposure, putting it in <coughs> a container um, can, can make that difficult. You know, so having a container that's UV Transparent. Right. Well, we just taped the samples on the outside. Yeah, that's yeah. one way. Of yeah. Doing yeah. It. And uh, with cosmic ray, you know, exposure, you need to make sure that you know, are you really, you know, what kind of cosmic ray exposure is really, really there. So that's the other thing. You can kind of right. Yeah. So you, if you look at the poster that my students presented, here's some. So this is the this, this is the cosmic ray exposure here, uh, uh, and this this UVA and UVB. Exposure, so that was a, especially you know the, this was so important to me in case the biology experiment fails completely, <laughs> which I, I'm still nervous about. So that at least they have some some interesting data uh, about the environment. Uh, yeah, that, those are great points. Uh, yes. Have you you or your students done any multi generational <coughs> experiments with the uh, microorganisms or just with the, the plants? Well, the, with the microorganisms, yes. So, so, so you're taking the cultures that have flown and you're reculturing that culture. Yes. Okay. Yes. And comparing them with uh, with controls that haven't flown and so on. And for plants, we haven't done that, you know. Uh, but it's doable. So, uh, with with Wisconsin fast plants, those are. I think you talk to any biology teacher and they know what those are sure. because they have this short life cycle. And there is a website, fastplants.com or org. I'm not sure that has a lot of curriculum. Uh, again, you don't have to invent any of this, you know, which is great for me because I don't have much background in it. Um, so, yeah, but but uh, that's uh, you know the, the beauty of, of using a, a yeast that have this mutation is that you can visually easily see which ones have a mutation, which ones don't, because of this uh, adenine effect. So, yes, Tim. Talking about being worried about things just fundamentally not working, I had some students doing something that's different from your your um, mutation. It wasn't with, with it was with some sort of a bacteria, um, and it turned out we flew late in the fall, and um, they killed them all on the ground before we flew. Okay, and, and all the controls died too. So basically, these things were not very good for sitting around in low temperatures, and they didn't see that one coming. They were worried so much about the flight itself. So. Yeah. Things can go wrong. Yeah, for sure. Yeast is very, I mean, we have a hard time killing the yeast. I mean, what, what does kill the yeast is if you fly it on the outside of a pod. We've done it three times, and there's never been any survival uh, of the yeast on the outside. But on the inside, they usually survive. Uh, and you get interesting differences in mutation rates. 